Let's go back to that. It may seem kind of a uh, uh, off the point thing, but it's very crucial at the beginning of this, at the beginnings of these talks about understanding the new feminine mysteries of Eros and understanding that the human being is designed to be an instrument of love in the creation. And that all our ideas are influenced by natural science. And we make assumptions about how good natural science is at being what it is. And if you re and Barfield, if you want to get into the depths of it, and every natural scientist who actually wants to think about these things rather than just live on the basis of his assumptions and his biases, needs to come to terms with the things that Owen Barfield has said about this. You know, he lived through the dominant parts of the 20th century and he was a brilliant mind and he understood a lot of stuff. Okay, now here I'm just going to bring before the person who's maybe here looking for a sex video a bit of deconstruction about what natural science can do and not do. There was a book written some time ago might have been as early ago as the 50s or 60s, and it was written by a man by the name of Thomas Kuhn, and it's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And you'll run into natural scientists that want to argue about it, but the fact is, is that the major observations he made <coughs> remain true. Whether people want to argue with it, of course they want to argue with it, they don't like the conclusions of it. Now, Thomas Kuhn, um, you know, I'm giving you a little education here that you won't get from school, but it's very useful when you just understand this very simple thing. If you've heard the word paradigm, Thomas Kuhn is the individual that reintroduced that word into modern usage and language, because what he said was, that, and, and we pr perhaps should get into to how he did this. I mean, this was a guy, I mean, I get the exact facts precisely correct, but basically I think he was was a young man who was studying natural science, science and he w wanted to be a physicist. And he was looking at physics and he decided, well, you know, I got this problem I'm going to work on in physics, you know, for my PhD and all the rest of that. And maybe it might be useful if I found, if I reviewed the history. So he started to look into the history of this particular problem and the related questions within the field of physics. and what he found blew his mind. And it was essentially that he'd been lied to. Now this was not an overt lie in the sense that that people were trying to pull the uh, wool over his eyes because they had some funky agenda. It happened sort of in the normal course of the development of science that, that these these ideas um, came into existence the way they came into existence. And it's a little bit like a, a rule sometimes you'll hear when people write about the history of wars and stuff, they say the winners write the history. Well, in natural science, the ideas that won contributed to the way the history of science was taught. And what Kuhn found out when he went back into the history of the questions that he was asking was that the history wasn't a straightforward development of the particular ideas which he had been taught was the way the history of science unfolded. It doesn't and didn't and isn't and won't in the future unfold in this straightforward fashion, you know, where it goes from one perfect discovery to another. You read basic science texts you know, like you get in, in middle school, and they will say, well, science discovered this, and then it discovered that, and then it discovered this, and then it discovered that. Well, that's half true. And the part that's left out is that, well, it discovered this, and it thought that, and then after a while, that didn't work anymore, so they had to give up that idea and start asking different questions. So then it discovered some other stuff, and that was good, and it had that theory, and that went along for a while, and oops! That theory didn't work anymore, so they had to abandon that theory. Okay. Newton, my goodness, Newton was an alchemist. 
And it, Newton gives us all these ideas of physics, but in your middle school book, you'll get, hear about Newton and his theory of color, but you won't hear about that the scientist poet Goethe had a big argument with him, and they talked about color in two entirely different ways, and in a certain sense, both are true from the point of view that they took from the paradigm in which they operated. Okay? Faraday, who gave us most of the basic theory of electricity, a guy by the name of Clerk Maxwell comes around and creates the equations that become the mathematics of electricity. But the basic ideas, the basic observations came from Faraday. He was a deeply religious individual. He talked about ponderable matter and imponderable matter. And by imponderable matter, he meant the spirit that was connected to the matter. Kepler, who gave us the founding ideas of planetary motions, the three laws of planetary motion come from a guy by the name of Kepler. Kepler was an astrologer. Okay? So when you read your history of astronomy and they tell you about Kepler's three laws of planetary dynamics, they don't tell you he was an astrologer and he thought out of those ideas when he looked at the stars. And in point of fact, when he discovered his third law, he said, Oh, I've rediscovered the ancient ideas of the harmony of the spheres. <laughs>